Welcome to Defy These Times, a podcast dedicated to the easy task of tackling the 21st century. It is a project born out of my conviction that doing so requires an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to understanding our complex world. I'm your host, Jiraya Yub, and in these episodes, I bring you conversations in the intersection of politics, history, philosophy, culture, science, and all the fun stuff in between. The following episode was first published for monthly Patreon supporters. To become a monthly Patreon supporter, please head out to patreon.com slash times or check the website for other methods. You can become a supporter for as little as $1 a month. And if you cannot donate, you can still support this project by sharing with your friends and family and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The music of this podcast is by Tarabit. Here's the episode. Hey everyone, so this is a conversation with Sofia Armen. She's an Armenian-American writer, scholar and organizer, and we spoke about the legacy of the Armenian genocide today. We spoke about race in the Ottoman Empire and then in the Turkish Republic, how the genocide changed Armenian cosmology. We spoke about the cruel absurdity of borders and various other topics. We actually also got into Palestine as well as our various positionalities, myself as Lebanese, Palestinian of Christian origins, and herself of course as an Armenian American, how this interplays in the context of the post-Ottoman space. And Sophia shared a lot about her own family's story in what is now Turkey. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thank you for listening and take care. My name is Sophia Armin. Um, I'm a organizer and writer and scholar from Los Angeles, California. Well, we're going to talk about a number of things, Sophia. Uh, Most, I mean, I think mostly not very happy things, I guess, but we'll see. (laughs) Um, I wanted to have a, at least one episode on this podcast. I haven't done that yet on, on the Armenian genocide and the legacy of the Armenian genocide specifically. I will mention that later. I have a, a bit of a connection in the sense that it was a topic that I, I was kind of obsessed with. Some years ago, I went to Yerevan during the centenary and oh, wow. it, was, it, was a, it was a big thing. I'll talk about it you know, in, in our conversation in a bit. But can you sort of... Um, you don't have to sort of explain it. Uh, you can contextualize it if you want, or we, we might in throughout this conversation. But you yourself are the descendant of eight um, survivors of the genocide. I have my notes here. Can you sort of talk about them? You know, their stories, where they came from, you know, that sort of thing? Yeah, be happy to. Thank you. Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I think thank you for doing this podcast, because as I've been following it, it's actually incredible. I feel like you're getting to the root of so many important voices, you know, in so many of these struggles that are often erased. So I really thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I just for people who might have absolutely no context, the Armenian Genocide refers to the systematic annihilation campaign by the Turkish government to target its own indigenous populations of Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks, um, roughly from 1915 to 1923. But scholars also have begun to kind of unpack, right, the thorough line that has existed prior to that, and then also after in the founding of what today is the Republic of Turkey. As you mentioned, I am the direct descendant of several survivors, and um, I'm also the direct descendant of several people who didn't survive also, and I want to name that. Um, And like millions of Armenians around the world, right, we have these stories and we share them, not only because they're important to keep, but because they're actually part of disrupting the the ongoing, um, not only denialism, but the structural racism and how it manifests So, um, yeah, I think it it breaks down actually into my name. (laughs) My name is Sophia Raquel Armin, and I am one of those people who doesn't have an IAN at the last part of my name, which, if you know Armenians, actually is quite a big deal. And it's it's a big deal for us, too, because part of when you are a community that's constantly worried about its erasure, right, lineage and family is really important. It's actually part of how we trace our nation back. Um, My... My grandfather's father was from Hajin, which is where I get my last name. And Hajin was a little village that was very particularly um, decimated during the Armenian genocide. 
And his whole family actually was massacred in front of him. And he was a small child. Um, and his first name was Armin. And he was eventually picked up by uh, American missionaries who were in the Ottoman Empire at the time, which is actually part of my research because I talk about disciplining and university studies and uh, the fringe right wing uh, <laughs> evangelicals that come from this era, just, you know, but we can get into that later. Sure, but yeah. they actually, um, they really took his name and they gave him a, a anglicized name um, and then made Armin his last name. And so this also then prevented him though even though the narratives around Armenian orphans during the time are so much about saviorism that I think a lot of uh, America likes to talk about, but they also cut him off from his family. He was then never able to connect with his family members. Um, and they called him Albert of all things. And eventually he ended up changing his name to an Armenian name, Avadis. But he's from Hajin, again, another, another very Armenian populated town that now just literally does not exist. Um, and my family's also from Vaughan, and my family's from Istanbul, and my family's from Harpert. And I'm gonna talk a couple uh, minutes about these because they're actually really important sites of some of the largest Armenian massacres. And, you know, Istanbul is always talked about because that's how we mark April 24th, which is the commemoration day, which was essentially when the Turkish government gave the, the orders to go round up intellectuals, right? Um, people who were considered a quote threat to the state <laughs> or who were who were seen as um, you know threatening um, because of their ideas um, but you know I was actually speaking with my grandfather like a couple weeks ago and he was showing me the pictures of their houses like in Istanbul and they still exist today you know they just happen to be filled with Turkish families. And particularly because this side of my family was wealthy in Istanbul, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason why they got to get out. Um, those houses now today, the ones that overlook, you know, the water, <laughs> all that, right? All that confiscated land and Armenian capital, right? Is one of the reasons why Turkey today is such a um, economic powerhouse in this yeah. region. And people really need to understand that because that's today that property is millions of dollars. You yeah. look at that house. Mm. Um, and then lastly, you know, I'll speak just for a second about Vaughn because I think Vaughn is a really important part of, of this quote debate <laughs> um, and the way that the Armenian genocide is framed as like a conflict or also this weird, I mean, there's so many different devices, but one of them is like a two-sided narrative, right? One of them, this was ancient history, we should get over it. One of them is like, you know, why are we talking about this now? But Vaughn is today, right, in southeastern Turkey, is the site of really the Kurdish struggle in Turkey, okay? I mean, it's, it's, it's populated deeply with Kurds and my family is from Vaughan, and every time I see the conversations about the Kurdish struggle in Turkey, which I actually really support, because especially in the Turkish context, I mean, we are talking about ongoing, real, just violence. Yeah. Um, Vaughan is a really important site because Vaughan is used as the scapegoat, okay, today by the Turkish government, to this day, <laughs> as the reason why all the Armenians had to be massacred everyone why everyone had to die right they say that the armenians in Vaughan rose up against the state and thus everybody you know they were all secret guerrilla fighters and they were you know had aspirations for a national homeland and thus right race extermination was deemed necessary and what's really interesting is i happen to come from one of those armenians who was in the self-defense of Vaughan. But I think one of the ways that this gets really interestingly um, misconstrued or constructed purposely by Turkish government denialist talking points is we need to remember that these Armenians were under the Ottoman government. They deserved Ottoman protection. And yet it was Ottoman soldiers who came in and, and tried to massacre the whole town. And the only reason why Armenians referenced Vaughn or why the Turkish government references Vaughn was that was the only place where really Armenians were successful at keeping, you know, these massacres back. And it wasn't even for very long. Um, 
And my great grandfather, Anushaban, was from Vaughan and fought in that self defense. And his whole family, not only were people massacred, they were driven out of Vaughan. They were driven through Derzor, right? Syria. And they were displaced. And on the way in these caravans, Turkish soldiers were instructed to either shoot or rape or steal from the Armenians in these lines that they were pushing out of their homes. And so that's the history that I come from. My middle name, Raquel, is my great-grandmother, Raquel, who had to save her child, Lucy, my Auntie Lucy, who I grew up with, who was an Armenian genocide survivor. And we know these stories live in us. We know there's no way. I mean, all the politics and all the politicking, <laughs> it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, like we all hold these stories. I mean, millions of us hold these stories. It's not just me. And all I know is when I hear them and when I talk about them today, people really do not understand how central they are to contemporary politics within the region and how central they are as lessons for the world about racism, about authoritarianism, about, you know, genocide, about ethnic cleansing, about displacement. These are fundamental truths and knowledges that we need to learn from, or they'll just keep repeating what you see today. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, something I want to get into as well in this conversation. Uh, the context, like just in terms of like when we're recording this, we're recording this on May 26, 2021. Uh, I think I initially contacted you like soon after the, the American government officially recognized it after, you know, a billion years of saying that they would do so. <laughs> yes, um, a billion years. Exactly. <laughs> they, they it's that true. Because like, yeah, yeah, so like, I do know, uh, I'll just say it for those who don't know, like, so candidate Biden had promised, and I mean, to his credit, he did. But there was a lot of skepticism because candidate Obama had also promised famously yeah. and didn't. Um, so, OK, I don't want to get too much into government stuff because I feel other people would do that. But to to be fair to, to, to because this was something that I know a lot of Armenian Americans, including yourself, like, you know, celebrated and something that's very important. Can you kind of speak of the important or the importance of official recognition of genocides? And I mean, yes. I mean, genocide specifically, of course. Sure. So yeah, finally, after 100 years, the United States this year, I know I'm laughing because it's like, it's not even laughter, it's exhaustion, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, think yeah, it's exactly. more like, um, and it's not even for me, it's like, it's the, it's all of us, right, collectively. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a celebration, it was a triumph, because mm -hmm. Armenians have never given up and we have been pressuring the US government for generations. I mean, this really picked up the recognition movement really, I feel like had its um, kind of its origin story in the eighties um, for real in this type of campaign. But when we're, when we're calling for US recognition, it's not just so that the West validates our histories. I mean, we believe our histories <laughs> mm -hmm. and we don't need any powerful government, especially the United States, which has its own ongoing genocide, right? Against black and native people mm -hmm. to, to tell us that this is real, right? That's never what we've been asking for, but this has been US policy. And that's what people need to understand today. That US policy that actually the United States has been blocking three generations of our families from this justice. I actually don't think Turkey could have actually prevented our justice or any form of justice without the US as its perfect accomplice. I mean, and I think that often gets lost in these um, discussions because there is a kind of like dichotomy or binary that's created, right? Which Armenians are erased from both sides. And so I just want to name like no, this has been the imperialist relationship of the U.S. with Turkey in the region because of its U.S. Air Force bases, because of its, you know, commitment to the NATO alliance. I think when people talk about the Turkish government as some anti-imperialist messiah, I would laugh because, you know, we're talking about a government that's literally in NATO. <laughs> I mean, we are talking about levels of military coordination investment that we can't even dream of, okay? Okay. I, when I say this, yeah, it's, just like, it's the like the scale, second or third biggest in NATO. Yeah, it's it's huge and it's so fortified and backed up by so much capital. I mean, there's so much. I, it's it's actually incredible. And so, part of the reason why it's so important, right, is because it's it's one step on a very long journey to that justice. 
And honestly, the United States has been blocking the door. And I, I have to say this for myself because it was really hard when Biden announced this finally, I mean, it was a slightly pathetic statement, right? I mean, it literally just used the word genocide, but we've been fighting for it for so long, we had to be happy, right? Part of the reason that it was so bittersweet was because it was like, I had these family members that I grew up with who just lived in this country where we would have to hear these talking points where they were literally denied, you know, not only access to their homeland, they're denied any form of reparation because the U.S. has been shielding Turkey. And, and people need to understand this. The U.S. is shielding Turkey, not just on the Armenian genocide justice reparations question. The U.S. is shielding Turkey on multiple crimes against multiple communities within Turkey, including against the public of Turkey. I mean, and so I always go back to just this was a triumphant moment for us, especially Armenian Americans, because our activism, because we refuse to give up. We have been using grassroots forms of activism that we honestly have built for so many decades and so many generations, and they were all required to finally get to this point. And that's why it's an incredible moment. Yeah, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. And sort of like the other side of that same coin in many ways, like one of the reasons why Turkey still officially denies it other than, you know, other and stuff, uh, is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's from my understanding that Turkey, the Turkish government actually considers itself the legal successor of the Ottoman Empire. And there's a difference between and this is from memory, so I may get this wrong. Um, because I know that, for example, the genocide that the Russian Empire committed, the you know against the Circassians, for example, the Russian state does not recognize them because after 1917, the Russian state overthrew the previous government, the previous state entirely, abolished right, right, it, sure. and said, you know, mm -hmm. we're no longer them, and therefore we're no longer legally liable. At least that's one of the arguments I remember. Whereas the Turkish government actually doesn't say that. It says that it is the successor of the Ottoman Empire. And part of why they would not want to recognize, uh, other than you know, current politics, is this issue of reparation. You you listed a very concrete example here. Do you still think this is part of the? Because I I'm saying this not necessarily to dwell on this too much, but because I actually don't hear this often. It it really is usually portrayed as well. They just don't want. They are just in denial, and we just need to persuade them, and you know that's the, you know that that would solve everything. Yeah. Well, very concrete thing that they don't want to do, they don't want to lose, quote unquote, and that's part of why they don't want to talk about it, or at least don't don't even want, or would even actively block other people from officially recognizing it, as you know the Turkish government still is doing. Yeah, I'll I want to name two two reasons. Okay, so for one, um, I think there is an actual legitimate investment in a racial supremacy that continues to this day. Because what people need to understand is, is that these events, there is a thorough line from these events and earlier, even the Hamadian massacres to today, yeah. which is there is a pan-Turkish ideology called turnism, and it is deeply prevalent in all institutions, all government infrastructure, the military, everything in the state. It's in its founding. Um, and I have to, I only chuckle because there has been so many different arguments from different parts of, of Turkish society that to me, they're all in the same political line, even though they believe themselves to be in opposition to each other. But the truth of the matter is, is yeah, of course, I've heard, you know, and each generation, it's a different thing, right? <laughs> Especially as Turkey's um, quote identity looks to where it should be facing, right? But mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is, is sure, we've heard, you know, we've heard that Oh no, there is. It stops at the Ottoman Empire and thus the Republic of Turkey has no, no responsibility. And then we've heard the absolute opposite. We are the new inherited neo-Ottoman rulers. We, we are proud of our history, right? And they're just like different levels of kind of the absolute fascist Turkish ideology that does exist. And it goes very extreme. I mean, and I think people need to understand this. I mean, it goes all the way into continued massacres to today and, you know, paramilitary organizations and really scary, like, I mean, I don't know how to describe them in English, but like neo-Nazi level groups, like that is what we have today. And the truth of the matter is, is that when I think of the race part, I think of, you know, that today Turkish identity would have to be challenged. And that's what's so scary to people. And that's what's even scary to the ethnic Turkish left. 
which, which is a kind of weird neoliberal thing where there's also a, a refusal, right, to sit with that. And I'll give you a great example. When the Occupy Gezi Park, right, protests came, they captured the world. I mean, really, I was here and it was beautiful. I was excited, you know? I was like, look at these youth rising up, right? And Occupy Gezi was so important because it was like, you know, we've seen in the HDP, like we've seen in so many of these youth protests, right? You see this kind of, co these coalitions that have always really struggled, right? And been under so much repression, but they come out in these beautiful moments, right? And they're from multiple communities, women, LGBT folks, right? And, and they're, they're, they're seeing their struggles as connected. This is a very beautiful thing. But while all this Occupy Gezi was getting so much attention, right? I was looking at Nord Zartank, who you all should know, okay? They are an Armenian organization based out of Istanbul, who not only carry on the legacies of the Armenian presence throughout this whole region, but are literally constantly under attack and are part of such a beautiful intersectional grassroots movement, okay? It's no coincidence that they're in coalition with workers and union folks and women and LGBT folks and even people who are worried about religious rights, all types of things. So Nor Zartank, while Occupy Gezi was happening, right, was talking about how Gezi Park is built on an Armenian cemetery that was raised. That literally, they were, they were having this protest on our bones. I mean, it actually, and this is in Istanbul, that's not even in the mass graves, right, that are in, quote, Anatolia. Like, we're talking about in Istanbul, and they were like some of the only people who were saying this, right? They were talking about the multi-levels that we have to talk about when we talk about today. When we talk about Turkey, we have to talk about, right? And so it was hard because I was here, of course, in diaspora, the worst place to always have these comments, but, <laughs> but we were sitting here and, and they were right. I mean, those were such important voices because it, you could just have a frame about democracy, right? And democratizing Turkey, or you could understand that the root of the state is built on genocide. And so you have to actually dismantle all of these logics because they're in everything. I mean, they're literally in everything. So that's the race conversation. Now I promise I'll make the class one a little shorter. The conversation that it, we have to have, <laughs> that to, when, we ha when we talk about, you know, why has this been denied for so long? I really do believe though, the, the identity question is a big one, right? Because they'd have to understand their closeness to Armenians. And this is like a thing that would fundamentally disrupt the racial ideologies that are pre present, prevalent today. I mean, pan-Turkism is so strong. It's the reason why the Kurds are so constantly under attack. But on the other end of that, too, of course, there's absolutely monetary incentive to keep this going. I mean, you watch the way that Turkey has, I mean, now for generations, right, just created this incredible tourism industry, right, of all of these places and this land. I mean, this is not, this is not a little bit of money that we're talking about. This is billions of dollars, right? If you're talking about this house that is, that is my family's, right, on my father's side, and you're seeing that, wow, this is an ocean view property that now someone owns in the millions of dollars, right, that is being, being rented out to American and British and other European tourists, right? We can understand that's a, that's a level of investment. We're just one family. And I got at least four cities just in my family alone, right? I mean, it's everything. It's everything. It's in all parts of the land. And I think that's why when I hear these, I've actually, I've noticed a shift because it used to just be like, you know, certain parts of the Turkish kind of uh, denialist camp, the, the, the Turanist camp would basically be like, oh, well, you know, this is just anti-Turkish sentiment or whatever. So we're going to say that the Ottoman history passed and we're in a new era. But the truth of the matter is, is like, if we're talking about the Ataturk era, if we're talking about really the absolute founding of the nation state, which we know did a lot of wreckage nation states throughout the whole region. But if we're actually talking about this, we are talking about mass seizure of Armenian capital. I mean, mass. To the day, to the point today, right? When you go throughout Southeastern Turkey, even as Armenians history and language is erased from everything, you can still see it everywhere. You know, the hotchkars are built into the houses. Like 
this is something so prevalent <laughs> in the Republic of Turkey today. It's impossible to erase. And that's what I would just say is that despite all these efforts, Turkey will never see democracy because these ghosts continue to haunt every question. There is not just one aspect of society that I wish I could tell you was impacted by the Armenian genocide. It's everything. It's in the way that people are, are conscripted into the military. It's in the way that people conceptualize their identity. It's in the way that the academic institutions were built within Turkey. It's in everything. Thanks a lot for that. I mean, so, okay, you said a lot of things and I'll try and, and you know, do them justice. Uh, I like that you use the word haunting. Um, that's literally my PhD. <laughs> um, oh yeah, it's about haunting. I love it's, it. It's about hauntings from the wars, essentially, on, you know, modern Lebanon, what's usually called the post-war, which I, I actually, part of what I do is say that there, it's a, it's a, we should stop using it. Um, but <laughs> it's something that, like even so, okay. I'll mention that as I said, I've been to Yerevan, and I, I wasn't there for long. It was just like a few weeks, but it was specifically in a context where, like, there was it's like it was like a crash course in 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 Armenian history. Let's put it that way. And started in Beirut. It started in Lebanon. I went to an Armenian bookshop. I got a number of things. I'll mention that story in a bit. But while I was there, it kind of struck me of how close uh, Turkey was. I actually, in my mind. Like physically, yeah. Yeah, like literally physically. Yes, I, I could like see literally it. <laughs> physically. Like I could right. see it. <laughs> right. And it, it just, right. it, it kind of, do, I mean, Turkey is massive, of course, but it kind of drove home this idea that, you know, you just made as well, which for me at the time was still very new, which was like, the links are very concrete. And um, I have a friend who now lives in Istanbul and he was, he was traveling, he knows the history very well and he was traveling in, in what is now uh, Eastern Turkey. Uh, and he went to one of those villages and he saw like there was the writing that was still there. I mean, writing that was still there and there were a lot of these things. And in my mind, I just remember, uh, now I'm kind of rambling a bit, but I just remember having all of those, um, it's not even mixed feelings, it was actually being just overwhelmed by just yeah. how much is still there, physically there, while at the same time not there. I mean, I, if that makes yeah. sense. And yeah okay so that that's one thing I'll, I'll try and think about this more um and maybe have a more coherent um you know thing, thing to say no it's great can one i comment thing? on this for a please second do, please do save me well i think one of the one of the most striking physical kind of open wounds i'll be honest is that you know you go into armenia and you can see ararat right ararat yes. is the yes. mountain the mountain yeah, yeah the yeah. mountains that we and I, I only name this not because of, I had this really wonderful conversation with some folks at the Armenian Institute um, a couple of weeks ago, not mm -hmm. to talk about like claim and not claim, but I want people to understand that Armenia, like the Republic of Armenia today, you stare at Ararat, right? Yes. And Ararat for us is the mountains, mountain that we have claimed like within our national identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's within the Armenian coat of arms. It's within like, how we communicate our identity to people. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really interesting because lots of other communities have different symbols, right? But the fact that ours is like land and a mountain and mm -hmm. one that we actually, and I say this, like is literally one that we care about, but that we don't have access to is really fascinating. Like if you were to think about and break up that that kind of like way that it is lived in our folklore, the way that it is part of Armenian identity, not just in Armenia, but in the diaspora. And yet we don't have access to it, right? Or that I will have to go there <laughs> and be, and get a visa as a, as a quote foreigner or as a tourist, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, this is absolutely like, it's just, it's just pain. I don't know. It's like mind blowing to me. It's one of those things. And so I don't find it when you're sitting there and you're saying like, yeah, I could see the border. It's because that's how close this is. Yeah, yeah. That's how close this is. And yet, and yet every day there are people who tell us how far away it is. And mm. I don't even just mean physically. I mean, how far away, like we are from our histories. We are from justice. We are from each other. Like there's so many ways that that gets completely, I think, purposefully, you know, obscured. And 
if you think, you know, if you think staring at it from Yerevan is tough, like, let me tell you, 20, you know, 15, <laughs> I would say 10 to 15 million of us who are diasporans literally from this land, right? Mm -hmm. Like staring at it from diaspora is, is really just... I don't know. There's a reason why they, there's a reason why all of our Armenian songs always are sad. Like, I think that's what it is. There's a melancholy about it that I don't think we get over. I just couldn't help but think of the, the Kurdish proverb, no, no friends, but the mountains, um, you know, mountains have important. Yeah. Mountains have very important. And also I want to say the sea too, because this is something important that mm. I don't think a lot of people also understand when you talk about like the psychic violence of genocide, like you have to understand the Armenian genocide changed the entire Armenian cosmology, okay? Like Armenians as a nation you t used to have active like thorough lines to the oceans. I'm very serious about this. This is not a, you know, people don't think about this. They always talk about today Armenia is a landlocked country, right? That's, that's literally blockaded by its neighbors that doesn't have access to basic natural resources and mm. also no oil. So has no investment, right? From the West it's caring. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is, is also like, I mean, my family lived literally on the shores of Lake Vaughan, right? Mm. And also we're talking about, you know, access to the Mediterranean. We're talking about ways that also the ocean or, or, or water or seas, right, used to impact Armenian folklore, Armenian history, right? And we don't actually often talk about this also, you know? There's parts, there's so, Armenian history is so rich because it's such a vast nation that has existed for so many so many thousands of years right yeah, yeah. that that part of also the 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 sadness and just i think the violence is that like it changed and shifted communities you know really even to the co to the cosmology and i say this very sincerely i mean you're talking about access to the mountains you're talking about to the sea i mean there's a reason why all these poems that everyone writes are about literally just touching the dirt mm. right and like thinking about home and thinking about displacement, thinking about going back, that we'll return, that one day we're going to return. And that doesn't even have to be a question about governments. That's just how people who have lived, right, or who think about home and think about homeland, right, think about themselves and their relation to where they're from. You know, like um, what we were talking, I remember I mentioned this recently as well. When So my grandfather is from Haifa, which is now obviously in Israel, and... Uh, and I grew up in Lebanon, uh, you know, borders, bordered. And but when you go to the border, to what is you know legally Lebanon Israel border, uh, you're closer to Haifa than you are to Beirut, much mm -hmm. closer actually, mm -hmm. like twice as. Mm -hmm. like, it it would take you maybe half an hour by car, if not less than that. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those things. I saw someone share the, a map where you don't have the borders; you just have the map, and it's just written like Haifa, Beirut, whatever. Yeah. It's just one of those things where at the same time, I mean, in the context of Lebanon, Palestine stuff, you realize how small everything is. But yep. at the same time, like it's physically closer. I would be physically closer to Haifa. But in all ways that matters, I would be very, very far from, from Haifa. Far away. You see what I mean? Right. Yep. And that's something that to me, when I've recently anyway, when I, when I try and explain what displacement looks like or how it feels, because I, I, I struggle to think about it myself. I didn't, I didn't grow up identifying as a Palestinian refugee because my grandfather was among the lucky ones who were naturalized. And so I just grew up Lebanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was just one of those things that when, when I try and explain the actual, almost like cruel absurdity of it, essentially. It's absurd, yep that's that's what it that's what it looks like that's that's the concrete thing that i physically can't i i could walk in theory to haifa that's how close it is it would be a few hours walk maybe but i obviously can't because the entire thing is militarized and that for me is yep. is almost as powerful of a story of like the nakba in the context of palestine as and i want us to talk about palestine in a bit as well but that that's as much of a you know good example of what that violence looks like as me just telling you, well, my my grandfather was forced out of his home and he was never able to go back. You know, I feel I feel like because it's still now, like you know, my grandfather was forced mm -hmm. out in the past. He passed away last year, so it has this past dimension to it. And you know, I've never been to that house. I've never been to that city, to Haifa, and so you know, I have a difficult uh, relationship even thinking about it. But I can physically go to the border, and then everything is 
kind of reaffirmed in some ways like now it's real again and there's no point being in denial like i don't know why it's almost like denying the nakba essentially would be so absurd when you're mm-hmm. physically there and you mm-hmm. know that you cannot take an extra step if that makes sense mm-hmm. that's how i'm thinking about it and i didn't think about this in those terms when i was in yerevan uh, but it's something that you know putting these pieces together it starts making more more and more sense like someone from ramallah who is palestinian does not have access to the sea because there is israel in between now obviously or someone from gaza has access to the sea but even that is also limited of course due to the blockade and so there are all of these multiple um sites of violence essentially and that actually brings me i wanted to ask you and sort of already answered it but maybe we can elaborate a bit more of like would you say that the, the erasures themselves are acts of violence in and of themselves and part of, you know, we're talking about the legacy of the genocide as the title of this episode, but, you know, it's legacy has this weird, I may even change the title, I don't know, but like legacy has this weird of like, well, it's in the past, mm-hmm. you know, and whereas what I was actually trying to get at is that it's a, it's a continuing process. Of course, it takes yes. forms and so on. But right. like, how do you go about thinking about this? Well, I have to tell you, I've, I want to say that I have been very like humbled and blessed because there's been a community of organizers in the U.S. who have taught me so much, you know, and a lot of those people have been, you know, indigenous, black, Latinx organizers, you know, when I was young. And there were those of us who were all in the, you know, from our region, like who were all, who were building with them very young. And so I think they taught us a lot of things. And one of the things that I started to understand was like, that first of all, the way that the West conceptualizes of genocide is absolutely just, it's, it's incomplete and it's not enough, first of all. Yeah, as something but that sec- just happened in the past and then ended and that's it. Right. So yeah. the, the thing I've been talking about as an organizer, but also in the academy now, which trust me is making plenty of people angry, is that, <laughs> is that genocide is not a one-time event, right? It's a structure of power and race is its defining factor. And so, you know, its legacy continues on, just like settler colonialism. And you can see this in the U.S. context so clearly, right? Um, and, and the truth is, is this it's the truth anywhere because race is constructed everywhere and people need to understand this it's localized it comes in different forms but it it is once again about a structure of power you know process race that's being made in process justifying violence justifying erasure justifying displacement so i don't think i'm able to say like you know one is worse or whatever like my family i mean my name is gone <laughs> Like my family, multiple people within my family were massacred. I don't think that, you know, having a a person, you know, make a denialist statement in my meetings is the same thing as, as someone's life. But I do also think that they're very much connected because you need you need the racism to justify those actions. You need the racism to justify keeping these cycles going. And what I would just say about this, you know, I was thinking about this also because it's not just in Istanbul. My my aunt and uncle went to Harput, which today, of course, Harput in Turkish, and um, they went back. And my uh, my family that had been displaced, they one of the men had drawn from memory his house, which you have to imagine that's pretty hard to do, right? But he had drawn from memory his house, like this beautiful picture. And so my aunt and uncle went back to Harpert and they literally tried to find this house, which is like a hard thing to do today. Okay. (laughs) But, and because they didn't have any clues, right. They had like a picture, a drawn picture of this. And so they searched literally for a very long time and they ended up having a Turkish man help them and they found the house and they went to the house and they were like, you know, overwhelmed obviously by it, but also when they were telling me about it or when they were talking to me and my mom about it, it, it's, it's also kind of that cruel absurdity that you're talking about, but it's also a kind of like, it's so big to think about how we could quote fix or how we could even think about the future that it's hard to even say, because within this house is not a government official, right? 
it's a poor Turkish person, like literally poor, like people who don't have access to a lot of wealth, right? And when they, when they saw my uncle and my aunt, they were like, you know, they were obviously like defensive that this was their house <laughs> and that they were living in here. And why were these Armenians who they're told every day, right, are an enemy, right, claiming this house? And what's interesting was my family wasn't even doing that, right? They were just coming back to, to understand this memory, to see if they could find it that they could localize it, locate it physically and tangibly, if it still existed, if it hadn't been destroyed, you know? And I think that's the, the hard part about it is, is it's an everyday thing. And I think actually Armenian organizers within Turkey have been the most eloquent to say this, you know? They have, they have beautifully, I think, articulated this. Um, I'm thinking about an organizer, young organizer named Arno, who's in Nor Zartank, we're pen pals. We've been pen pals for years, you know, um, mostly just for our own sanity, I think some days, but, um, you know, when, for those who aren't familiar, you know, um, Harant Dink was a Armenian journalist, um, uh, and also organizer. I claim him as an organizer. I don't care. Everybody wants to, whatever, <laughs> um, from Istanbul who, uh, founded this Armenian newspaper called Agos. And it was very important because it helped, shift a lot of these narratives in Turkey itself. And he was deeply beloved by the public. And I think people need to research him because he was such an important figure, not only because he helped influence the public of Turkey, but he also pushed back on us as diasporans, you know, he challenged us, he challenged us, he, he brought us back into line often. And he was often in very big political debates with many of the major transnational Armenian diasporan organizations. But, you know, when he was assassinated very recently and he was assassinated by a 17 year old. And I think that's why when you say, how does this continue? It's like, how can a 17 year old, right? That's a teenager. How can a teenager say this man, not just cause he's Armenian, right? But because of what he represents and what he's saying, right. And what he's helping make connections for within the hearts and minds of the Turkish public for them, right. That he is a threat right? He wasn't one of the militant organizers. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't part of a, a underground political party in that way, whatever, right? I mean, this was, man was a, in every sense of the word, an intellectual, helping people understand, storytelling, touching people's hearts, right? And he was assassinated by a teenager. And then the Turkish police come and take photos with him. When they arrest him, they're proud. They hold up a flag of the Republic of Turkey with him and take pictures. And this is plastered all over the newspapers in Turkey. Right. So I think about these Armenian organizers because, you know, in those moments, you can always just look at all of the awful, horrific, violent, you know, um, events that unfold, but also, you know what Armenian organizers did? You know what the youth did? They marched, they organized, they got all of the, representatives from all of these different marginalized and oppressed communities within Turkey. And they, they marched in his memory. They created so many, not only organizations, initiatives, right, today that continue to help people make these connections for social justice in Turkey, for global justice, right? They connected to us in the diaspora. And that's why I know it's like, the struggle never stops because these systems haven't stopped. And the truth of today is that the Republic of Turkey in every way, its current leadership, right, in every way, the Armenian question is, is there, haunting all of the time, yeah, everywhere. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, couldn't have put it better, to be honest. You know, like what your, what your family did in going back, it's, it's basically the plot of returning to Haifa, uh, Rasan Kanafani's novel where it's also like um, a family leaves or is forced out of Haifa. And I think 20 or so years later, they go back and they find this uh, Israeli family living there. And yeah, I'm not going to spoil it, but it's, it's one of those. <laughs> yeah. It's one of no, those. No, I know it. I, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a it's a moving story. I recommend <laughs> yeah. it. I've mentioned this a number of times. Um, but, you know, okay. Just on, on the Palestine question, just because of the timing of when we're recording this and then, then we'll move on. Um, no, let's talk about Palestine. I want to do it. Come on. Perfect. Let's do it. Perfect. We're recording let's this like I'd love to. We were about to record this while the bombs were still dropping. Now, as it happens, we recorded right. and they stopped uh, 
hopefully for good. But you know, unfortunately, we right. know that probably not for good. And God the the um, recently we saw, an, of course, a lot of global protests, and you know they're important and they're much needed, and you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't need to repeat this, but we also saw some some tension. I mean, they were they were mostly played out online. But some of it was necessary tension, I would say, in the sense that, you know, these conversations need to happen. Other times, not necessary tension, and so we'll, ex we'll uh, exclude those. But what I'm referring to specifically is that in a number of locations, not everywhere, not in even most places, but in a number of locations, we saw a lot of people, like, waving Turkish flags. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is... You know, but we also saw in other locations, we saw people waving the free Syria flag. We saw people waving the Armenian flag. We saw people waving, you know, other flags. So we saw definitely multiple narratives and communities and, you know, other people kind of uh, saying, well, we stand with you too as well. But specifically when it comes to the Turkish flag, that obviously has the, that kind of uh, bitterness to it, you know, not due to what we're talking about here, but also due to what the Turkish government is doing in, especially in the Kurdish areas of Syria, northern Syria, Rojava, specifically today. And I'm wondering, like, from your standpoint, as like an organizer, Armenian, uh, definitely linked to the Palestinian struggle, and, you know, you've spoken about this, and of course you're linked uh, with friends and so on. How do you sort of deal with those um, images if you don't see them directly in front of you? I don't know if you see those in LA, but if you see the- All day. You, Oh, oh yeah, okay, we see okay. them all. We see all of them. We forget how how connected the internet has <laughs> connected all of us. Oh yeah. Oh no, we see all of them. Everything. So how do you how do you go about thinking about this? And what are, are there? Does this kind of generate conversations? Let's put it that way. Not necessarily with the people waving those flags specifically, but like with other people. Let's say Palestinians who may not know why it's such a big deal, for example. They, they may just see a Turkish flag and say, well, you know, they stand with us, you know, well, we need all the support we can get, et cetera, et cetera. How do you sort of, how do you get into these conversations? Because I can imagine they're, they're quite sensitive. Sure. Um, well, I get into them almost every day. And it's not just me, like us as organizers collectively, we're always yeah. doing this, right? Because we have to teach each other. And, um, and we also have to unlearn ourselves, especially as Armenians in the West, to be honest, because the United States very particularly has purposefully alienated us from our own histories, right? And it's deeply invested in doing so. That's what white supremacy does. But um, so to begin with, I, I actually think it's very important that we talk to each other, right? Especially when you're talking about oppressed communities, right? They're not structurally at an advantage where, <laughs> where um, you know, these are the same thing as oppressive states. Like when we are in movements, right? We, we learn from each other, we build with each other. For one thing, what I wanna start with is that um, Armenian, Palestinian, Arab, very specifically, like joint struggle is very long. And it's not just part of my generation, even though we see a hyper visibility around it right now, especially online, like it's, it's very long. And so many of these literal fedai, like guerrilla fighters, we're trained by each other and 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 this is how it's been for generations. I mean, I'm not, you know, I I don't look at this next chapter like as isolated or special. Like it's from a long history legacies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. The things that I I think about today, which I, I just need people to hear me on this, <laughs> is that, you know, Erdogan is a Trump figure. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry to make that analogy, but I'm also not because I need people <laughs> to actually understand this, that Erdogan is literally someone who rose to power because of racial populism. OK, yeah. Yeah. and I'm talking about this in mass and I'm saying this like the exact same like bravado puffing of the chest, like racism that that I think like maybe Americans could identify within the US as being a Trump thing, even though it's a systemic thing, right? We we can understand, right? Erdogan, that's part of his his um his power. That's part of how he projects himself. Okay. And I need people to understand this because that Trump like racist populism is what's fun is literally fueling and funding his ongoing movement, so much so that he has changed and rewritten the rules to stay in power, to maintain this, right? So it is in every way an act all the time. It is a constant performance. And part of that performance is that Erdogan today is all about, 
I am the anti-imperialist messiah of the Middle East, right? I am the one who's going to save us all. It's so much posturing and it's, it's so deliberate and people need to understand it comes through cultural work also. You know, it comes through very state sanctioned media campaigns and a lot of very, very deliberately, you know, staged kind of speeches. I mean, they're, they're incredibly like, I don't know, like grand and all about kind of appealing to this idea. And you know what? Armenians have not been fooled by this because Armenians, we went through pan-Arabism. We went through, you know, this kind of idea of the global umma, whatever. Like when you're Armenian, you deal with this stuff, which is fine. It's okay. Like we need an anti-imperialist analysis. That's correct. That is a hundred percent. We are down with this. We understand. But also like these masculinist, racist, authoritarian, like, you know, as our as our response as our that's the struggle are we kidding me like i wrote a poem and i'll just name it for a second because it says everything we're talking about palestine it's just and it was from a couple years ago when erdogan got up there there was an armenian journalist who literally his family was massacred the armenian genocide and he asked him a question i think it was at one of the g20 summits and he goes like erdogan how can you speak to the Armenian genocide? We really, we need to understand today's contemporary politics within this context, right? And he goes, bring out the historians. We need the academics. The historians must come together, right? This is a talking point every day of the Turkish yeah, government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Armenia has closed archives. We have everything open. We're an open book. You know, it's all, let the historians decide, right? And my response was basically, I'll give you the damn historians, Erdogan. But part of the beginning of it was like, you know, you advocate for Palestine, you have your own Palestine. You literally say that you're the, the, the center of refugees. You're creating refugees every day, okay? Our own families can't come back to these places. This is ridiculous. I mean, it's completely an act. And that's why I sit there and I, I, I am saddened by it because, of course, as the Palestinian cause in desperation, right, has had to seek different kind of spaces of the exile, um, political organizing. I understand that. And Istanbul has become that in many ways, especially over the last couple of years. And I know that I've watched the shift in my lifetime. You know, we just have to know that then. And that's part of the reason why so much of our youth organizing is so important with each other, right? I have so many of my Palestinian like co-organizers, right? In our, in our movement spaces here who literally are being invited to, to conferences in Istanbul, right? I mean, repeatedly, daily, like all the time. And, and that's all fine. But we have to know, like, okay, you're going to somewhere that is depopulated its own indigenous population. So we have to sit there and understand that. We have to build these bridges. We have to be able to call them out or don't go, <laughs> you know, or, you know, you have to use your platforms and understand and, and connect with each other. So there's that, first of all. But then the second part of it is, is it's actually, unfortunately, and I, I thought about this before I came with you today, because I thought about you know, maybe I'll just keep this stuff secret for my whole life, right? And just keep doing this stuff in the background, but I can't do it. I don't care. If I die, I just need it to be out there. You know, when I was in the University of California as a teenager, right, this was a very beautiful time for Palestinian solidarity work within the U.S., led by Palestinians, led by Arab and Swana people in general. And we were really starting to make connections around our racial identity, right, within the US. We were like really divesting from whiteness. This is a really big important thing. But part of what was motivating that divestment from whiteness, white, right, was really, and I'm not talking about solidarity from other communities that are not impacted or not racialized and orientalized. I'm talking about like people from this region were making the connections amongst oppressed groups, okay? And when that divestment movement, BDS, was in the U.S. and it was starting to finally break through into like a mainstream, right, that took it, where SJP was finally like, it was a kind of tension because there was, you know, it wasn't just an out of space anymore, but also it was kind of awful that that was happening. There was a lot happening, right? But part of that emergence that was happening was people were really sharing their struggles with each other and were communicating transnationally. And that was true. And so what I want to say is, the divestment movement within the UC very particularly, and then in CUNY and so many places within the United States, Armenian and Palestinian organizers were just doing that together all day. That's what they were doing. And, and the divestment movement specifically here within California was so interconnected that the Armenians actually created a divest Turkey campaign out of it, using each other, they were helping each other 
And I'll never forget, there was a moment, and this is an anecdote to describe what you're saying, and I'll finish it with that. There were two moments that emerged in that era, and it's connected to today because we had an event happen today, and it makes sense. (laughs) Um, So there was a moment um, when I was in school uh, where the Irvine 11 within California were targeted, Muslim men, 11 Muslim men from um, Irvine and Riverside. And they were targeted by Zionists, huge Zionist backlash at a time where it was very, very deeply unpopular to be pro-Palestine here. And, you know, just completely racist attacks on Fox News everywhere. I mean, it was an onslaught. And a lot of Armenians organized caravans to these events and helped and went to the trials and like supported, you know, these folks. Um, then what ended up happening because the Turkish lobby was starting to understand we were organizing with each other, they were very upset (laughs) and they actually started to intervene. And I'm not talking about like, okay, just people who are of Turkish descent. I'm talking about Turkish lobbyists from the government were very upset. And this was pre kind of what we're seeing today. So much of the bravado of Turkey as the savior for Palestine, but, but this was happening so intentionally and orchestrated the, their intervention. So at one point, when the divestment of Turkey and divest the BDS against the Israeli occupation, right, and against for Palestine, was, was so crossing, they started sending Turkish government officials to Muslim Student Association meetings. Because they could not imagine that these Muslim student associations were standing with Armenians. But of course they were, because we were building these movements against racism, against displacement, against we understood their connections, even if they're not the same, which they're not. And there was a moment, there were two moments I'll never forget. One of them was, I was at a divestment meeting at UCLA. Um, First, it was the Palestine divestment meeting, and then secondly, divest Turkey. And they sent a Turkish government official to go talk to the MSA, convince them as collateral, literally, that they could not come out in support. SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, and the Muslim Student Association could not come out in support of boycott um, and divest Turkey because they would be hurting refugees and they would be against the Ummah. That's literally what they were telling them. And they sent this poor kid, and I'll never forget because I was in this meeting across from it, this poor kid who is a Syrian kid, Syrian, right? To come be the spokesperson to this whole table of a bunch of random American kids who had no idea what we're talking about, right? To come up there and say, if you, if you believe in, you know, boycotting, divesting and sanctioning Turkey, you're going to hurt our people. You're going to hurt everyday Turkish people. You're going to hurt refugees from all these areas. It wasn't even just Syria. It was like, I mean, they just talking point after talking point after talking point. And I remember just sitting across the room and I stopped the whole conversation because I was like, listen, in solidarity with all oppressed people, we stopped the room. But I just understood the level that they were afraid of us working together. I mean, they were afraid. They sent government backed money to go to an MSA meeting. That's pretty absurd. And then lastly, sadly, in 2015, and I'm saying this to you because you're a comrade, okay? Like, it'd be different, right? When I have to talk about this to like, white audiences or people who have no idea what I'm talking about is harder, right? And I, I have to, I constantly, trust me, especially because I know how Middle Eastern Christians are weaponized against Muslims. This is part of the reason we have to intervene all, all the time. We have to check it every time, right? But there was a moment in 2015 where I had been, I mean, really, like we had been deep organizing with folks in the Palestine movement for a long time. Also, because Armenians are Palestinian. This is not like a, you know, I mean, when you talk about Palestine, are you talking about the Armenians too, or you're not? So when we were in all these spaces with each other in 2015, the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations put out a statement right ahead of the 100th anniversary, which was like our really important day, as you know, when you're in Yerevan. And they put out a huge statement, which I had not seen from Arab organizations, to be honest, in my lifetime like this, but a huge statement that said that the genocide never happened that said that historians should should debate it, that gave us a literal line by line, two sides, both sides talking points about how 
the U.S. government shouldn't recognize it on the 20, on 2015, that this was part of some Islamophobia attack, that this was, I mean, everything that would only be written by a Turkish government official. I mean, it was like line for line. And it was so hard for me because I was sitting there and these were like, not only people I knew, I don't care about, fine, personal, whatever. But I'm talking about like, we had built movements. I mean, we were in each other's spaces. Like, this is not like a, you know, I mean, we had been under fire together, all of us. We had been building these things when there was no one, when it wasn't popular or sexy or anything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And when this came out, there was a really important internal conversation that happened. A bunch of youth organizers stood up, really important ones. Palestinians, also just Muslim non-Palestinians were like, you can't, why are you doing this? You're using actually every tactic that the Zionist lobby is doing. You could replace, you could literally replace Palestinian in the words that they were writing in the statement. And you'd be like, wow, the tactics are so similar. To this day, that statement, no apology, no retraction. And as a matter of fact, today, today, literally today, this week, we as Armenian American Action Network, we not only, we endorsed and are co-organizing the March for Palestine on DC right now. That's led by American Muslims for Palestine and that same US Council Muslim organization. The second we got put on it, surprisingly, I don't know how, (laughs) today we learned that the Turkish American whatever organization has now been asked to become a full partner, like literally within days that we have been put on this. And I think what I understand is just, I don't sit here and, and, I'm not angry, I'm like disappointed. I'm like saddened by what could be because all of these groups need each other. And it's not an ethnic thing, it's not a religious thing. People need to get that through their heads because mm-hmm. this is how very specifically people are divided and conquered in the region. How oppressed people, right, are yeah. always pitted against each other. But I sat there and I was like, I can't believe they're just two-sided <laughs> us still. you know. And I've been writing these internal letters for years We've been really doing a lot of reaching out, bridge building. This is not new, you know, but the forces against us are very, very powerful. And that's why I want people to to hear hear us on this, that there is a deliberate attempt to recruit you into the pan-Turkist narrative. There's a very deliberate, because they need you. (laughs) Because actually, there's a reason why Erdogan has to make Palestine his talking point because he doesn't have an oppressive talking point to, to have. You know what I'm saying? He has a failing economy. He has people, right? He has a country, really, honestly, that, that he is trying to iron grip forever. That's what's happening. So that's his distraction game. It's an act. And when I sit there and I hear, you know, it's not just young people. It's like uncles and... <laughs> And, and, you know, dads who are like giving his praises. I just want people to understand that, you know, it's a very deliberate, it's really a very deliberate, um, especially cultural power that, that is trying to be uh, distributed amongst people. And, and I personally don't think Turkey is the saver of Palestine. But I, <laughs> I, 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 um, I also, though, want to just say that I believe like our communities can only really liberate our, ourselves but I also believe that that happens by working, oppressed people working together. And that's always historically how it's ever worked. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Remember when you told me that, you know, I should be, I should be long winded. You were totally <laughs> like taking that back now. I told you I'm literally like, a no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> I, I wrote down a lot of notes with actually this is really good. So, okay. So I'll go through a number of things. Um, one, I think I've learned so also the, the hard way, let's put it that way that, because, you know, I mean, I think you know this. I follow Syria a lot. It's something that I yes, even take I it personally you. at this point. And I know, like, not even in retrospect, it was pretty obvious while it was happening, that when the the broadly defined Syrian cause was sort of delinked from the broadly defined Kurdish cause, i.e. when those became two separate things within the confines of the territory that is now Syria, i.e. when the, the, you know, I won't get into this too much because that's a different conversation, but... The, the opposition leadership essentially did not fully understand and actually were pretty dismissive at times of specifically Kurdish grievances uh, that were put forward. That for me facilitated a lot of what followed. You know, it facilitated 
uh, Kurds needing either the Americans or even at some point needing uh, the Assad regime, although that didn't last very long, that facilitated all of those then quote unquote ethnic um, tensions and hatreds and whatnot that we saw online, like we are Arabs, we are Kurds, we are Arabs, we are Kurds, where in, in 2011, not that this in itself is a problem, of course, but in 2011, we actually had specifically in Kamishlo, we had protests that had the Free Syria flag alongside the, you know, the, the Kurdistan independence movement flag or the Free Kurdish flag, I should say. You know, those things would happen and those were actively forced out of the uprising and the revolution. The, the photos that for me are some of the most memorable ones are like, you know, we are Alawis and Sunnis together. We are one, all of these things together. Those are things that were explicitly and actively rooted out, not just by the Assad regime, which is the, the obvious one here, but as well by all of the foreign powers like the Turkish one, namely, but also the Saudis and the Qataris that were, at, I don't want to get too much into it, but were at times not very comfortable with this becoming a diverse thing. And they actually wanted this to be a more of a Sunni thing or more of a Sunni Arab thing, depending on on well in the Kurd in the Turkish sense most Sunni thing in the Arab sense most Sunni Arab thing and this is something that for me I, I was put in very awkward positions at time because you know I'm Lebanese Palestinian also like of Christian origins and I was told by like a a Syrian member of parliament parliament in quotation but like basically member of the Assad regime's parliament he called me a traitor to my sect um which i find amazing because he wasn't even christian <laughs> but like i found this amazing but it's just one of those things that ends up just okay let, let me phrase it in, in so i don't ramble too much but the the positionality of a lebanese christian and a palestinian christian and the lebanese palestinian christian specifically is precedes me essentially like the history behind it and the connotation of what does it's supposed to mean who I'm supposed to stand with, what I'm supposed to, you know, like and dislike, who I'm supposed to be afraid of, and so on and so forth, precedes me essentially. That I need to always, um, like, it, it's like there's a baggage. I need to first unpack the baggage, and then maybe I can, I can have enough time to have to say anything. And this happens a lot. <laughs> uh, this happens uh... a lot. It, it, I'm, to I'm totally on, um, I'm totally on the right. Or let's put it this way. When I just say things that are like anti-Israel, the poor Erdogan folks are totally fine with me. And they're fine oh, with I me know. being a yeah. Lebanese Christian, blah, blah, blah. All of that is totally fine. Yeah. And when I'm uh, opposed to the Iranian regime, uh, Zionists are totally fine with me. Like, that's fine. Oh, We're yeah. totally oh, yeah, fine yeah. with that. All good. Yeah. You know, we support you. All fine. I get retweets by them as well. You know, everything is fine. Uh, when, you know, whenever, whenever you kind of cross into, mm -hmm. well... Let's also talk about this other thing, you know, like, let's also talk about Turkish flag. No, like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. You know yeah. As soon as you complicate it a tiny bit, that's when you're not, that's when you kind of push, it's like you're pushing lines that you're not supposed to be pushing. And I've seen this from the Assadists, I've seen this from the Erdogan folks, I've seen this from pro-Israel folks or Zionists, I've seen this from all of these people that don't really like one another, and yet they utilize the same kind of framework, totally on board, they they will love they will love you they will praise you they will they will platform me uh, not that I accept but they would platform me if I just stick to saying like if I if I was just condemning American imperialism whatever I said this would love me no problem hello sahala you totally fine you know you're more than welcome you're our brothers everything's fine you know we love you we we love you Christians all fine all is fine as soon as you talk talking about Iran or the Syrian regime you know then then that's when things get get quote unquote more complicated but you know when you were talking about the the uh new ottoman stuff i don't know i'm sure you know the photo of like when mahmoud abbas visited erdogan in 2015 there was these 16 warriors behind the erdogan yes of course That's this is what i'm talking about though but do yeah, people yeah. understand like the level of of cultural performance i mean you're a cultural studies person yes you know what i'm saying i think yes. people need to understand this because it's not just in that there's about I mean, I swear it's being marketed to like Muslim social justice organizations in the U.S. because yeah, I don't even understand how it's getting so far. But there are like several Netflix, you know, like <laughs> yes, TV yes. shows right now. Yeah. And it is like having this like cultural power where it's like fine if you understand what what the heck you're actually watching. 
But if you don't actually understand what you're watching, you actually are consuming quite a lot of political information. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. And by fascinating, I mean horrifying. But the truth of the matter is, is I, I just want to say one thing about what you said, because it's, it's very powerful. OK, first of all, when you do <laughs> when you're consistent in your values, trust me, you lose a lot of friends. That's the truth. Yes, OK, yes, so that's that, yes. that's one thing. But yeah. also in the other sense, there's another beautiful there's another beautiful side to this. Right. Which is that this is also why we need a strong left in the whole region. And there's there's not a coincidence, you know, it's not a coincidence that you're talking about it. There's been so many forces that have eradicated that and have, have and what have we had left in, in many cases? I mean, this is the truth. <laughs> so so you we need we need principled left. And I and I know it sounds like like a pipe tree. I mean, it just sounds like I'm in a different world, but I'm very serious about this because that is what they're all afraid of. They really are. And it's not just a left. I mean, it's like really like a, a joint struggle, organized, right? Like connected, right? And and of course, I mean, the ethnic religious, trust me, I'm so I'm Sophia Armin, who's working in Arab and Muslim studies in the US. <laughs> like, I know all about like the way that, oh my God, it's like, it's it's totally weaponized all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's weaponized all the time. It's like, it's not even a question of that you should be loyal. It's also like, you somehow then are letting down your entire community, particularly if you are from a community that so rarely gets talking space. You know, it's really hard when, trust me, you're, you're a minority within a minority within a minority. It's, it's really rough. But I think that's also part of the problem. And, and maybe I'll even rephrase this. It's like, people will always talk about these, quote, extra grievances as like not foundational to what we're always talking about. But anytime someone talks about minority rights within like West Asia and Africa, it it's it's just already setting up a problem there. Like it's not a minority question. Just like this is again, I'll go back to Turkey. You have all these researchers, Western researchers all the time who go into Turkey and are trying to quote probe the Armenian question, right? And they'll talk about it through the lens of minority rights. And like, sure, this is part of the question. You could think about liberal citizens and their rights, right? The relation to the state. Okay, fine. Sure, yeah. But you also need to think about, once again, the root. Where's the root of this? Where's the actual analysis? Where's the structural analysis? And this is not just a question for academics. It's for organizers, right? Like, we do actually have to project out, even if we won't see it in our lifetime, okay? We do have to think about, like, what do we actually want to create as alternatives? This is very important. For this whole region because yeah so many generations before us do this but there's a reason why they all have a thorough line and, and ask the same things right it is about okay a pluralism no we're not going to start at a kind of like assumption around identity what do we know about that it is literally just created not only divide and conquer it's created massacres over generations and people displaced over and over again i mean this cannot be this cannot be the armenians know this because we've been literally just placed on triangulations of land over and over again and it's the same thing when I look at Turkey today and I'm sitting there and I'm like, it can't just be a conversation about like integration or we need to make sure we, you know, add on. This is like a separate thing. This is not a separate thing. This is about what are you actually fighting for? These are root questions and causes. So that's what I also, because I often get that, to be honest, <laughs> as, as I think Armenians get this constantly, like basically in every every context we're talking about, except for in the Republic of Armenia, people are like, let me talk to you about minority rights. And you just want to sit there and you're like, you don't actually fundamentally understand how this region even exists. Yeah. I mean, really, like yeah. you're replicating the things that you're saying that you're against. And it, it doesn't just influence like how we talk about it. It actually influences how our struggles are shaped, yeah. how they move. I'm not kidding. And I'll just say this just to end and I promise. <laughs> Within the West, it's really hard, right? Because it's also, there's like the diaspora element. There's so much going on when, sure, yeah, when we yeah. talk about yeah. creating a kind of political cohesion or whatever, you know, whatever. But what I will say, one thing that I have found very powerful is when we do create these kind of like pan diaspora organizations that at least can have like leftists then be supported by each mm -hmm. other. That's been mm -hmm. a really important mm -hmm. thing that we've done here is there is 
there's also a way then that we can intervene on each other's behalves, right? So you don't need to stand alone. <laughs> you're not supposed to stand alone as like a Lebanese Christian, whatever, whatever. Like literally you're supposed to, right? Have backup from other people who are in these struggles. So that way we can more effectively dismantle them. And that's what we have to do. And, and every generation that has ever been successful in any form of liberation struggle has done that. So I will say this is that the clash of civilizations thesis is racist. We know this. <laughs> Gosh, is everyone listening? We know this. The class of civilizations thesis by Samuel Huntington, we know mm -hmm. is racist, mm -hmm. right? Okay, mm -hmm. reinscribing it from the other side of it it's also <laughs> is racist. And we don't want that either because that's yeah. not real. That thesis is not real. Yeah. It's literally not real. Yeah. The irony of having random organizers in this in the country I'm in, the US, yelling at a bunch of Armenians that they're not pro-Palestine, who are literally from Palestine. I will never forget these experiences. I mean, it's just wild. We cannot believe what these power structures tell us about ourselves, let alone about each other. It's unacceptable. Well, I can't tell you the number of times I've been told not to comment. Or oh, I've been actually told multiple times because I condemn the Assad regime in Syria, that I am soft on Israel uh, as someone who's from Lebanon. And it's just more, who's also Palestinian, <laughs> putting that aside. Um, you know, like for me, the, also like to kind of to your, to, to your point, the specific positionality I come from, the reason why I kind of sometimes mention it, although it, it can be pretty tricky, as I'm sure you know, like it's pretty tricky to claim that identity and be have it a politicized identity in the context of Lebanon, because sure, the sure, sure. in Lebanon is already highly politicized and pretty right wing. And the... Um, the fact that I come not just so that's one thing, but also from the Palestinian side complicates things a lot. And I, I often see a lot of people not almost not knowing like on in which box to place me, because it's if I, if I'm just sticking like, like to the pan Arab stuff, which I'm, I'm not a pan Arabist, but if they, people think that I am talking about the Palestinian cause as an Arab, let's put it that way then the fact that I'm Lebanese and Palestinian, it's fine. Like, you know, they just complement one another because, you know, all Arabs, because that's how the narrative works. Pan-Arabism, which, of course, as you mentioned, like erases everyone who's not Arab and Palestinian, but they tend not to go that far. And but it's also specifically in my context that when Lebanese people look at me and for the most part, just see me as another Lebanese, they don't understand that when I then talk about like refugee rights in Lebanon, I'm not just saying, hey, we should be nice to refugees. I'm saying you were nicer to my grandfather. <laughs> you you al allowed him in the club because he was of the, the correct sect, essentially. Not too dissimilar of a reason as to how Armenian refugees in Lebanon were allowed to be Lebanese uh, citizens. I'm saying allowed, which is a problematic term, but the authorities, yeah, yeah. you know, allowed it. Let's put it that way. And of course, the implication of what I'm saying is that they also did not allow other people to become Lebanese. And I'm not even saying becoming Lebanese is necessarily the ultimate goal here. Many Palestinian refugees in Lebanon don't want to become Lebanese. That's not the point. But the, the barriers to any kind of even increased rights to any kind of anything, Tautin as it's called in Lebanon, in, in Arabic, is used as, as an ongoing process of scapegoating first Palestinian refugees and then Palestinian and Syrian refugees. And this is something that is fundamentally part of, of a, a Lebanese identity problem, something that I also try and emphasize. But as much as I try and get into it, being interviewed on podcasts by other Lebanese, being interviewed on news outlets by you know Lebanese news outlets, bringing these questions up, it's almost always with like one exception maybe in the past decade, framed as I just want to be nice to minorities. You know, I just want minorities to have increased rights. You know, I just want things to be okay, you know, and that's it. It's not framed as I'm actually saying this is a Lebanese problem. I'm saying this is a Lebanon problem. I'm saying it's not a refugee problem. It's not a migrant domestic worker problem. It's a Lebanese problem. And this is how it should be framed. But to this day, it's actually pretty difficult to get into. I don't want this to be a Lebanese discussion because I fucking always bring up Lebanon whenever I whenever I talk about anything. I mean, yeah. I do have a justification here because of the legacy of obviously Lebanese Armenians and the, the heritage of Lebanese Armenians 
for those who don't know, I mean, I would just probably do some episodes specifically on that at some point. One of my favorite factoids is that the first, the only uh, rocket that was ever launched from Lebanon was a Lebanese-Armenian rocket. It's just one of the funniest, <laughs> it's just one of the most random oh my gosh. from the 60s. And they're still, if you go to Haigazian University in, in Beirut, they mm-hmm. have this model rocket in front of the, in front, oh of the in front of the building. So anyway, I'll, I'll do something on that at some point. I wanted us, if that's okay, to, but the, you mentioned that in, like, in the beginning of this conversation, the, the, the racial element, the racial component of, of the genocide, of genocides in general, of Turkish government. Are you, are you going to make me answer this question? I just want to know. Are you going to put <laughs> Aram's article in front of me? I want to know if you're actually going to So, me. maybe. You tell me. Okay, maybe. let me, t- okay, let me tell, tell me. you why. I'll tell, tell you why. Tell I'm going to tell, tell, you, I'm gonna tell you a little story because it's all connected to everything that I've been talking about today with you. Okay. Which is, I think people need to understand, first of all, that there are beautiful global networks of organizers mm-hmm. and that oftentimes... We're all very connected <laughs> and it's not as, as um, especially in this digital world, you know, it's not as separated as we would think. So I'm going to, I want to name a little bit of a backstory about what you're about to bring up because <laughs> I think it's a good context. Um, so first of all, Aja Media Collective, who I, who I love and who are by wonderful folks who are doing so much work. Um, had published actually a series of pieces um, and one of them was about uh, how Armenians became legally white within the United States. And you were going to reference this. Um, and I actually want to mention this because it's really important because it, uh, it comes from someone who I consider a friend, <laughs> Adam. And he, uh, I don't actually think, and, and he might get mad at me for saying this. So I just want to again, preface that I love him dearly as a person, but also politically we can disagree. And that's okay. Um, Of course, yeah. So I actually think he published this, to be honest, at a particular time. And when I I believe actually it was talking back to what a lot of us were doing on the ground at the time that he was deeply connected to. And I will tell you that there was a really burgeoning, important and still is um, SWANA movement within the United States. And I'm going to just name this very, very specifically. Okay was initiated by two women, Armenian women, um, Nairi Shirinian and Christina Mehambod, who started with just a checkbox campaign. It wasn't deeply politicized at that moment, but was for the first time divesting, not just Armenians, but Assyrians, Arabs, Iranians, Persians, Kurds, like, and had so many groups on there, not just like, okay, everyone from West Asia and Africa is Arab or Persian. <laughs> like, I mean, really, we're doing a lot of this work, but they they started just with it in a kind of racial justice resource campaign idea, right? It essentially blossomed, though, at that time, in my opinion, and this is just me, and people can have different opinions on it, because of the coalescing of that with the divestment movement, which politicized us so much, and these communities were already working together because of these things. And we started identifying ourselves not just based on like our identity, we were starting to map structural power together in that organizing necessity, like you were talking about, right? Which is like the leftists could cover each other's backs in, in every community, because we also had backlash amongst everyone in our communities. We were having to defend each other, right? Because of these ridiculous ethnic and religious and all these divide and conquer tactics, okay? That's an important moment that was happening. And I actually met Aram for the first time at the Student of Color Conference. <laughs> um, and there were many Armenians there, many Arab folks there. That's actually where the Swana checkbox was first introduced as a campaign. I uh, uh, told a group of us about it in 2012. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of all these coalitions formed out of it. But the reason why I'm talking about this is there was really a lot of back and forth debate about this, right? And a lot of those conversations also had to do with anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity and how people were understanding themselves politically, where they were, what they were willing to do and what they weren't willing to do. Okay. And one thing that I will just name is because Aram interviewed, uh, he interviewed me at the student of color conference actually about this. He was like, why are so many Armenians here? Why are these connected? Why is the Armenian genocide connected to this, whatever. And we were talking about race. And one of the things we talked about, which is relevant to your conversations is that we have to learn about race, including if we're in diaspora. So Mm -hmm. if we're in the United States, we have to understand how race is constructed in the United States. And one thing that I will just name, because 
this is why I'm an awful academic. <laughs> I'm literally an awful academic because <laughs> I've just been writing all this stuff online, you know, and just and just weirdly telling people in DMs and stuff, right? And in our meetings, right? And this is why I'll be an awful academic for the rest of my life. But, you know, this is actually what my research is on. My dissertation is on this. It's on literally the racialization, okay, of West Asian and African people from <laughs> from the early 1900s until now in three historical flashpoints and how people have defined their own classification and bup bumped up up against the state through the perspective of leftist organizations. This is literally what I do all day, okay? And I'm not saying I have good things to say about anything, but this is the weird niche thing that I really have a lot <laughs> of time that I spend on, okay? And one of the reasons why I think it's important is because only recently have we begun to really talk about a lot of this stuff, but also because we are, we're kind of learning our own histories around it. So a lot of like Arab Americans don't know that, yes, Arabs were given like, you know, legal whiteness in the early 1900s in a case called George Dow versus the US. And yes, you could yeah. read that through the state archive and understand it that way. Or just like in the Armenian case in Cartosian, you also need the parallel archive of the community because these communities aren't only everybody. They're not everybody. They're refugees from Mount Lebanon at the time and they're refugees from the Armenian genocide. Mm -hmm. And they don't actually want whiteness. They want to not be deported back to villages, one that no longer existed or literally lives that are under violence. And so they, they fight through a grassroots campaign for naturalization because there's mass deportations happening at the time. And what I love about this conversation is not one that it eludes conversation around privilege, 100%, oh my God, legal, structural, all those things. But the opposite, it actually teaches us how the American empire works. It teaches us how, how not only white supremacy has worked, but how anti-blackness, how anti-indigeneity has worked in this country, how it continues to define people's lives. And sadly, and I say this sincerely sadly, because I want to just, Described it. it was one of the reasons why me and Harag Vartanian, you know, bless him, Harag like reached out to Aaron was like, we need a follow up piece to this because it's actually just incomplete. It's just incomplete. And, you know, we did. And we had this conversation in LA Review of Books to have that. But one of the reasons why we were so adamant about it is, is, is it literally affects our community to this day, to all of our communities. So this is one thing that I'm researching right now for a chapter, and I don't care, I'm giving it all away because I believe in democratizing knowledge and this is why I'm an awful academic, okay? But I need people to understand this. There is a, there's a thorough line that you can literally trace from mm -hmm. the Muslim ban today, mm -hmm. literally the Muslim ban to the Armenian genocide refugee policy that the US had with the Ottoman government. It's almost identical and it's very hard for people to understand this, but I need people to understand these are long standing traditions. What do I mean by this? The Muslim ban, first of all, affected thousands of Armenians. But because of the, you know, political narratives that you and I were talking about earlier, right, they're erased from this. Why? Because the organizers that we were all in, in the no Muslim ban ever coalitions, right, they were like, no, it's easier for Americans to understand. It's Islamophobia motivating it. I'm like, yes, anti-Muslim racism, totally. But like literally thousands of our community are on this. I'm not talking about for the narrative. Like you need to work with them. We need to work together, right? When we're talking about these things, we also sometimes end up flattening it. So people who don't know anything about us, right, are able to digest us and, and our legibility is understood. So then it's fine. <laughs> but we lose a lot when we do that. So part of this Muslim ban conversation that was so hard was so many of the communities affected, not only were not Muslim, but so much of the rhetoric then instead focused on how this was about, you know, like weird like hate crime thing as opposed to like literally ripping families apart and structural violence and like an imperialism problem that we've had for a long time right but this muslim ban when you look at it i mean and i i literally not only was organizing it in it every day <laughs> but when you're talking about this the communication that the u.s government had with the respective governments of the nationals right that were denied entry because of the ban, right? Is literally what the United States government was doing during these early racial Supreme Court cases. So there was actually a system that the Ottoman government, literally the Turkish government had, that is the prototype for the current day terrorist watch lists, where they were creating literal 
registra- registers. Mm-hmm. And this happens today all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Of all of the quote, you know, to be threats. And they were sharing this information with the United States government. And not only were they sharing it, they were constantly sharing it and they were deciding their citizenship based on it. So the Ottoman officials who were not only massacring our families were actually taking records. Those beautiful pictures that you see of Armenian photography, sadly, which we have always thought were about preserving memory, those were literally state records to keep track of Armenian families and to actually name who in the family was there. And not only were they either being pushed out and then not allowed back in to their villages, okay, but some of them within the Ottoman context were being prevented from leaving. So it was both ways. Today, you can take this exact same example and it's so awful. You know, there was so much outrage here in the diaspora, which I don't even want to get into, talk about divide and conquer, but... When the Muslim event happened, which was very important, right? Galvanized a lot of people to get out in the streets, understand this. But there was a moment where Iraq, the government of Iraq, sold out basically its own people and made a backdoor deal, right, with the administration here. And was like, we'll take Iraq off the list, right? If we're allowed to deport, if the U.S. And the U.S. said, we'll take Iraq off the list if we can deport undocumented Iraqis that we've had in this country for 30 plus years, and you have to take them back. And you know who these people were? Chaldeans. They were Chaldeans in Detroit. And you know what ended up happening? Literally, the Trump administration went with buses. I mean, it was horrific. I, I can remember the day. I can remember how much chaos there was and how we, everyone, we were on so many calls. It was a nightmare. And the Chaldeans, I mean, really, were pulled out of their church on Sunday and rounded up into buses. I mean, people who have been here who, for 30 plus years Right. And there were all these debates in our communities. Oh, we don't talk about undocumented issues. Oh, whatever, whatever. Right. Just to stand racially with other people. Heaven forbid we have racial justice conversations. Okay. When that happened, it was like textbook what I'm studying every day in almost every generation of refugees that have come here. It is absolutely horrific. When I want people to understand about race for particularly like Swana, or at least I'll I'll focus for a second in the Armenian case is that Armenians through every generation have faced anti-refugee racism. It doesn't matter what generation you're looking at to the U.S., it has happened. Because not only are Armenians at the crossroads of so many of these, you know, imperialist exploits of the U.S., right? But they're impacted by multiple systems, and that's what's happening. And so... I just want to name that I don't I don't look at and I, I say this because there's many, many people saying this now and it's beautiful. Nana Magbule wrote a book about Iranian Americans and the limits of whiteness. Same thing. Literally exactly what what we're all talking about. Sarah Gulateri wrote Between Arab and White about this exact same moment. And so it's very important for us to talk about complicity. And then I also want us to talk about some of the roots of it, what we're talking about, which is like anti-blackness. That's actually also a really important piece that people are instead trying to you know, go around and, and, and say anything about, but that's actually like one of the central things people need to understand about the genocide in this country and how your identity is built on that. Like quite literally built on that. Your naturalization was built on that denial of humanity to black people. That is what it is. Okay. It's not enough to just say like, oh yeah, whiteness. That's not enough to say, because also non-black people of color, literally same thing it's this anti but I, I i really am like sometimes i'm sitting here in these conversations and i'm like they're so incomplete because also even if you are from a group that's been displaced even if you did come to this country as a refugee okay fine even if you came here because directly of u.s actions right you can understand the struggles that are happening here you can understand that you're coming to a place right that has an ongoing genocidal racist history and that you have to be in joint struggle with it This is part of the absurdity, but also the promise of our future. There's nothing else that's left. We have to have that. So I laughed because I saw your question about it, but I also just want you to know there's always an organizer backstory for all of these. (laughs) And all I can say is this, is like what I would say as an Armenian here within the United States context is my call out to my community is if you do anything in this world, if you do anything, right, I'm serious, in this country, in the U.S., I want you to be part of the reparations movement here. And I'm very serious about this. Armenians understand reparation struggles. They should get it here. 
they should understand for real the justice organizing here. And they actually should not only be accomplices, quote, they should be in the joint struggle. They should be doing the back labor around it. That's what should be happening. So I'll have these conversations about, you know, Supreme Court cases forever. But the reason why they're relevant now is because for the first time ever, all of these communities are <laughs> fighting for their own checkbox on the census. And it's the exact same debates we were having in the University of California in those 2011, 2012 eras. And the power that I find in them is that we actually could have an anti-racist, anti-imperialist analysis that is affirming of all of our communities, but also doesn't claim them all to be the same. And also doesn't claim that everyone in this in this in the Americas here do have the same experience because we don't. So uh, what you were talking, I was, I was thinking of the this bookseller in in Beirut, um, an Armenian guy. I wish I remembered his name. I feel bad now. But people listening, it's like I think there's only one bookshop next to AUB, like the American University of Beirut or behind it. So I, I think it's that one. If I, if I remember, it's one like, well, that would have been 2015. But anyway, so this guy, I went to his bookshop and I wanted to buy anything you have on Armenia. That's basically what I stole them because I was I was about to travel like a month and a half later. I didn't know much. And I was on this assignment for Global Voices at the time to cover the centennial. That was the thing. And I got the, that fancy press pass that allowed me to be close to the you know lovely politicians, all of that stuff, whatever. But I went to his, his bookshop. And I told him, okay, I want this, I want that, I want this. And he probably just assumed I was Armenian. He just assumed because, I mean, probably most people buying these books would be Armenians, uh, my, my best guess. And so he spoke to me in, in Armenian. I had no idea what the fuck he was saying. And he, he <laughs> which to Lebanese Arabic immediately after. And uh, that, you know, then, but as soon as that happened, I saw, uh, the way I remember it anyway, is that it's almost like that piqued his curiosity a bit more. Like, you know, why is this, you know, why is this non-Armenian guy buying so many books in Armenia? And so we got to chat, whatever, I told him, I'm going to do this. So do you have a personal connection? Like, is your family, do you have an Armenian family? He's like, I don't think so. You know, I think like, you know, basically I, I, I was saying, it's just something that I'm interested in. I'm just, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't remember. I said, probably said something stupid. And he then said something that just stuck with me all the time. He said, um, into uh, Ermeni hello. Like now, now you're Armenian, and mm. that—that's something that it was just such a moving thing. It mm. took me by surprise at someone who's like, I have these billion identities in my background. I never could pinpoint to this one thing. And he just told me, "Don't worry, you're Armenian. You chill. You know that—that's how it felt mm. in my mind." And I mean, obviously, it's in a symbolic way. But I remember this um, moment, and it's why when I did end up going to Yerevan, and I went with two two Lebanese Armenian friends. Uh, there's a funny story there, but that's another story. Um, I went there because, so okay, the funny story is that as soon as I arrived, the people at the airport, they also thought I was Armenian. <laughs> 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 I was in an airplane, you know, it was the centennial. So obviously most people <laughs> there were Lebanese Armenians. Right. This is true. And he spoke to me in Armenia. I had no idea what he was saying. And so Love it. Yeah. So, okay. Anyway, that was the story. And, but when I went there, I had these books with me and there was, there's still the stamp of that bookshop uh, and everything. And so that kind of, for me, the links were sort of made in a textual manner, if you want. And that's why like books, especially these books that have these specific histories have this added meaning like to me personally. And I feel like that's a pretty good transition. I'm actually pretty impressed by my transition here into the, <laughs> into the book section. Um, Okay, I have a number of books I will, I will throw out after after you kind of give your own your own recommendations. But what are three books that you would recommend, and 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 why? Can I cheat? You can obviously cheat. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. I just wanted permission to cheat. <laughs> yes, you have you have that permission. Um, okay, great. Um, so I have two lists. Okay. I think that because I wanted to do Armenian specific titles for you just because honestly, it's very rare that I think um, everybody just gets to hear all of these things at the same time and then know where do we go for our next steps for building that struggle or how can I help? Um, so I'm going to start with the non-Armenian titles that I think everyone should read. <laughs> um, I think everyone should read the book. It's an anthology. And it's called This Bridge Called My Back. And 
Have you heard of it before? No? Okay, great. I'm so happy. Let's no, let's no, talk about it one day. Let's do a book club, me and you together. We're going to do this. We're going to read this book. This Bird Called My Back is an anthology written by or edited by Cherry Moraga and Gloria Enzaldua. And it is a women of color anthology that profoundly shaped U.S. social justice movements, actually just all types of feminism globally. And I think it's an it's a necessary read for everyone and everyone should read it. It's deeply impacted my life multiple ways. So this bridge called my back, please read it. It's fantastic. There's so many wonderful people within it. It's a great book. The second book that everyone has to read is sister outsider by Audre Lorde. And I think it's one of the most powerful books ever written. And I, I think it's important not for people to weirdly project their own struggle into. I just want to mention that because that's like happening all over the internet all the time. But to read and to listen and to learn and to read, I think it's brilliance, truly. Also had a really big impact on my life. Um, Another book, which is a fun find, (laughs) non-Armenian title, but slightly Armenian, um, is actually called Food for... Our Grandmothers. It was an anthology that was written in the 90s by Arab American and Canadian feminists. And it has recipes in it. It's structured kind of funny, but it's kind of in a pre-war on terror moment, which also shows you, as we all know, that literally racism doesn't start right (laughs) after 2001. But anyway, it's it's a really important read. Um, Not not only because it helps elevate, I think, like feminist and queer voices very early on in these diasporas, but also I think it helped set the groundwork for so many amazing things that we're all doing today. Um, And, you know, I of course love the anthology by Rabbi Abdulhadi and, you know, Evelyn and Zoltani here and Nadine Neighbor, Arab and Arab American Feminisms, these are great. But, you know, all of these things are always built on each other. And so I would love if people read that because within the intro of Food for Our Grandmothers is actually a really wonderful debate about the racial identity (laughs) of our communities, even in the 90s. And what I love when I read those, right, is because sometimes you find yourself, you feel alone, you know, sometimes, even when you're surrounded by people, you know, and when we're organizing, we're always surrounded by each other. So it's not like we're alone. But sometimes you think, man, are we just screaming into the void? Like, are we just screaming about these same things into the void? And I find solace, really. Like, I find peace in the archives and seeing people, too, who, yeah, are getting bashed by the same awful right-wing people in their communities who are having to speak up for different issues, right, who are getting labeled all these things, right? And just hearing actually what they're saying and how they're thinking about it and their strategies, right? We can learn from each other. It's all built on each other, you know? Every generation takes up where the last one left off. So I love that book. As you can see, I have a thing for feminist anthologies. I love anthologies because they're written in collectivity and I hate the individualism of the academy and I think Mm -hmm. it's really Mm -hmm. stupid and annoying. But I love these anthologies because to me, they're like a big organizing meeting and everybody's talking to each other and, you know, kind of talking over each other and we don't know. (laughs) But those are my favorite three recommendations. That's what I would say. And then for Armenian titles, I actually think there's so many, but... I have, I, have, I have three that I will name that I would love if people, you know, saw, watched, or read. The first book is called Armenian Women in a Changing World. It's actually a publication of a conference. Um, it's conference papers by AWA, the Armenian International Women's Association. It's an organization that um, just really importantly elevates Armenian women's issues. But within this this book are so many powerful Armenian liberation struggle theories and it's constantly, no one cites it. No one ever talks about this conference that happened. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful and I really encourage people to read it and you could buy it online. And then my second one would be actually, I think people should read The Right to Struggle, which is by Monte Malkonian. Monte Malkonian is a Armenian guerrilla fighter, 
kind of icon actually within our community. It's connected to a lot, the art sock struggle, etc. But I think you actually should read his writing himself. These are, it's a compilation of his essays, articles, like a couple lectures, I think, and um, letters literally from prison that his, um, his brother compiled. And I actually think people should read it, you know? And you can be really critical of it and that's fine, but you should read it. Um, it's called The Right to Struggle. Really encourage people to read it. Um, and so many of the divisions we talked about today and so many of the so many of the fun things that we talked about today, you know, they're present also in that. And then lastly, I'm actually going to recommend instead of a book, don't hate me, I know you love books, but uh, a film. And I think on the Armenian genocide topic, and also this, this is like weirdly pre-war on terror, but like also has airport surveillance security in it. So once again, we have a lot of things to talk about, but um, it's called Aradat and it's a film and I really encourage people to read to, to watch it because I think it helps get at some of the identity questions you were talking about and also some of the contemporary implications of the Armenian genocide. And that's what I would like to end with is that we're talking about the afterlife of the Armenian genocide. And it is very present, almost like, you know, radioactive material. It's in everything. It's contaminating everything. And one thing I would just leave people with, especially if there's anyone from, you know, Turkey who's listening, is that in order for you to be free, we need to be free too. And the thing about oppression, which people don't understand, is that it does do harm to the people who inflict it because you have to rationalize this violence. You have to build identity around these, these racist ideas and keep them going, you know? And so you're also corrupting yourself. And so there is a way that we can find some type of future based in justice. And if we were to think about what that afterlife looks like, sure, it means a lot of repair, but it also means that we could build something different in the future. And that's what gives me hope. Fire These Times is made possible by supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support through a monthly donation, you can head out to patreon.com slash fire these times. If you want to explore other options, you can do so by checking out the website.